all of engineering is about problem solving and that's how we are here today with all the developments and even being able to have a quantum computer sit behind us in yeah. interviews because people dare to push the barriers. In this series, we're going to be visiting institutions that are working with IBM quantum machines and seeing the impact these machines have had in their work and their research and in the community. Melvina is a second year PhD student here at RPI who is exploring uses for this quantum computer in aerospace engineering. So I did my undergrad, my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering in Ghana. And then after the degree, I applied for a PhD in aeronautical engineering here at RPI. It seemed like a very good school, good faculty, good student life balance. And by then I didn't even know about the quantum computer. I came up here, I met with different professors in their labs, talked about research and entered computation. My advisor talked about the quantum computer. And it was just like about a year ago at that time, there was the ribbon cutting for the quantum mm -hmm. computer, all the buzz about quantum, and I was being sucked into this new world. And my advisor is Professor Lucy Zhang. She runs the computational mechanics lab, and she's very innovative, always looking at what can we do new? How can we push the limits? And so with the quantum computer emerging, she, it's one of the things that she's um, excited about, quantum education. And at that time, I was also just joining the lab and picking up an idea of what I would be doing. And so she suggested, hey, how about we do quantum computing applications for computational fluid dynamics? Whenever I talk about it, it's a very long sentence, yeah. So it's developing quantum algorithms for CFD, modeling or simulating fluid flows. And we already do it with a classical computer, but there are some bottlenecks with it. So as we are entering a new paradigm with a quantum computer, we're trying to see or leverage the possible quantum advantage we can gain from quantum computers in our simulations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I know partial differential equations, PDEs, yeah. are generally very hard to solve. They are. But in your particular area of research, like what are those bottlenecks exactly? Okay, so one of the applications of CFD and one of the difficult areas in CFD is simulating turbulent flows. So turbulent flows are, as you hear the word turbulent, it's very complex. I mean, when you are simulating regular lamina, laminar flows, like yeah. they they have a more uniform stream streamlined and it's easier to simulate and do some approximations. But then when you're doing turbulent flow, the flow is very interesting. And so being able to refine your mesh enough to both capture the dynamics of those tiny eddies at the same time the large ones requires a lot of time and also requires a lot of memory because then every mesh I mean the tinier your discretization is mm -hmm. the more node points or the more degrees of freedom you have to calculate for and it gets like you need like terabytes right of storage for like very high fidelity simulations and so we want to leverage quantum computing in that when you think about turbulence, even though, of course, the first thing you think about is aircraft and maybe about a crash or something. There are, <laughs> and so turbulence occurs on large and small scales. But even in a small container of turbulence, there's still so much detail. And so when you bring it back to the aircraft, you can imagine how massive the um, amount of flow you are trying to simulate is and how even more complex the turbulence is. But you know, like most of the stuff regarding aircraft, I know every, that's actually an interesting thing. Many of my friends tell me that you are in aerospace. It's a very high precision field. And one of my jokes is, these people don't know the number of approximations we do every day. Like engineering is full of approximations. <laughs> All the time, every time we run on approximations, but these approximations work. Yeah. Uh, the closer we get to more accurate results, we are able to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean we are unsafe with the current simulations, but the more accurate we are, the more efficient we are, because then we understand the physics more and then we can better understand where we can trade off some things or some costs because yeah. we understand where the details lie, something of a sort. In this particular field, in aerospace, mm -hmm. you know, there aren't necessarily like specific algorithms that were created for that application mm -hmm. area. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to sort of be creating the algorithms while the technology is being developed? Yes, algorithms are being developed even though the computer is still approaching its usability, should I say. And Many of the algorithms that have been written down or that have been proposed haven't yet been ideally 
implemented because we are still waiting to reach that level of quantum advantage but still it's a good area to do the research because we wouldn't want to be in a place where now the computers are ready and we are now fumbling and looking for an algorithm so and algorithm development does take a lot of thinking a lot of time a lot of implementing and a lot of optimization right. so the earlier we start working on these algorithms as the computers are advancing the better because it does take a lot of time to even consider how can we reduce maybe if you're using a gate-based approach reduce the gate complexity of this step or this algorithm so that it runs on the quantum computer more efficiently reducing error running faster and all of that stuff. So. I think it's so cool that, you know, as a second year PhD student, you're looking at these algorithms that are being developed and the technology is also just like catching up to you while you're doing that. It's just really cool. It feels like a gamble sometimes. It's like, will this work? Yeah, but you know, that's a whole PhD. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, part of the PhD is to find out if it will work, how it will work. And then when you reach, find, I find a problem. I find it interesting. Like, how can we solve this problem? Because all of engineering is about problem solving. And that's how we are here today with all the development and even being able to have a quantum computer sit behind us in yeah. interviews because people dare to push the barriers. Right. That's what we're doing. Can't be afraid. Yeah. I love that you and your group are approaching it with that just like this, you know, optimism and curiosity and it doesn't come from a place of fear and oh, what if it doesn't work? Before I even took a course at RPI and quantum computing, I did the Kiss Kids Global Summer School. Oh, very cool. So like, yeah, I really like I appreciate um, IBM's efforts in making quantum learning accessible to all people. Even before the summer school was the platform, the learning platform, watching Waltress's videos on quantum information because I didn't know anything about quantum. So it was like it was a steep learning curve and was great onboarding. And then here at RPI, I took a, a course, Quantum Computing for Engineers. And it was also a very helpful course. It was very practical. The lecturer kind of balanced the technicals, the, the, quantum, com the quantum mechanics details, as well as modern approaches and like algorithms and using Kiski. Kiski was what we used and we're running on this quantum computer in class. So it was really cool. Like in our school, we use a quantum computer. Yeah, that has to be a very unique experience. How do you think that having access to the quantum computer has changed, you know, RPI's approach that you have seen in the classroom setting? Yeah, I think, first of all, I feel, oh, I think it gives us an advantage over other people or other places because I don't, I haven't, I haven't had to subscribe to the premium plan on the quantum computer on my own because just by being an RPI, I get to use a quantum computer. So definitely it has saved us cost as individuals who are interested in quantum and also just the queuing. Because when I was in the sure. kids quantum um, uh, uh, global summer school, people were like using like the open plan and having to you have to wait wait long but i was in rpi so i was like ah. <laughs> there's something about having a practical experience like it's one thing to be taught something that is pretty abstract and to have to simulate it and you can't really have a feel for are these really the results an actual nisc um, nisc computer will give us currently and but in our class because we had a quantum computer we can actually run stuff and know that this is exactly where we are at. This is what we can have and think about how we can improve or improve our algorithms or our processes. And that is cool. How do you see the quantum computer sort of tying into the next few years of your right. thesis? Yeah, of your research. Yeah. So currently I am working with the lattice Boltzmann method. So my research currently, and it's evolved, so I'm just talking from today, is I'm doing quantum lattice Boltzmann methods. And one of the challenges I am noticing or facing is from the encoding step and the measurement step, because what I want to do is to extract some form of a state vector, but that's easy to do on a simulator, but kind of more complex to do on a quantum hardware. It's looking like I'll be focusing a lot more in the next few months to years on how to perform these measurements, first of all, accurately and to optimize the process of performing a measurement and even encoding initial conditions of my PDEs in the computer. So that's where I am. Thank you again so much for talking to me about this. I've learned so much. I did not know anything about quantum computing for aerospace engineering before this. And now I know a little. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again, Melvina. Thank you too. 
It was great getting to talk to Melvina and understand how quantum computing is changing the landscape for research at RPI. In the third and final episode in this series at RPI, I'm going to be talking to Jeremy, who's an undergraduate student and also the president of the Quantum Computing Club at RPI, to understand not how this is changing his career trajectory and his research as an undergrad, but also how this is changing the landscape in the classroom in terms of quantum computing at RPI. Stay tuned for that, and we'll see you next time.